let's go on. So our next lab, you know, we're going to do the midterm here, but um, our next series of labs, when we next get back to our labs next week, um, are going to start to address this issue of fragmentation. We already started that with a lab that um, was due today that I moved to being due on Wednesday, which is our Google Earth lab, to start to look at fragmentation. And again, for that lab, I just said we're looking at apparent fragmentation. So I don't expect that you know that color patches dark green and one's light green. I don't expect that you went down and analyzed what species of trees those are. This is just gross visual, you know, visual landscape elements. And so the, this was our first lab activity to start to look at this, to look at the large scale what's going on. One of the most, well, yeah, let me say that, okay. This is a badger out on uh, about uh, three miles from campus here out on the Oxnard Plain. So um, badgers are not exactly, um, they're not endangered, but they're not common. We've had them uh, reported you know, for decades in this area, but you don't frequently see them. In this particular case, this guy is out in the middle of the agricultural fields. He was probably, uh, so there's, this is a little bridge, little, little, little uh, there's a drainage ditch underneath this uh, section of road. Uh, I think it's right after the stop. I think it's on that side of the stop sign, I think. Um, and, and, and so don't know exactly, but it seems very likely that, that he was going up and down this, this waterway as a, as a dispersal corridor and was kind of cruising down and then for whatever reason decided he wanted to go over the road and was bad news for this guy and he got, he got whacked. Um, so, so roads are, are a real challenge for mobile animals. Again, as we've been saying the last couple lectures, these themes are popping up over and over again, these landscape ecology themes. Um, the scale at which something is happening, um, energy is flowing, animals are moving, what have you. Spatial variation, spatial heterogeneity, and how that community is, is, is stuck together. Disturbance and the inverse, which is stability. And now that we've had our discussion on metapopulations, this part starts to make sense. Number four, which is patch orientation. Do we have a bunch of patches? Are they in a daisy chain? Are they, are they shotgun splattered across the landscape, etc.? And this idea of species area curves, that as we sample larger and larger areas, we tend to get more and more things, more and more cate categories of, of our. Um, subject of interest. So currently, Caltrans in California, uh, whatever the entity we want to pick, uh, our county roads, our, our county public works, etc. Um, folks that think about transportation and, and planning cities and, and urban corridors and things of that nature are currently really big on wildlife corridors. And why might that be? Why are wildlife corridors a a hot topic these days. Any, any thoughts? No. <laughs> I didn't sleep last night. You guys slept. You should have some kind of answer. Okay, I guess multiple reasons depending on what you're looking at. From all the ecology aspects, you're looking at the environment, you're looking at the Okay, okay, so a public safety thing and stuff like that, but why now? Why, why are people suddenly in the last few years, decade or so, really into this stuff? So all the things Cassidy said were right, gene flow and, and all these kind of good things, but... You're saying why are we concerned now? Yeah, well, I, I'm just telling you that, that they're increasingly popular, things to think about, have a conference about, have a planning session about, whatever, and I'm asking why. Right, right. Because we've, come, we've, we've finally come around to realizing what a massive imprint we are exhibiting on the landscape. This is a great paper. This, is, uh, this came out a few years ago. This is a very simple, a, gr a great example of a study. Very simple thing. This is something you could have done in a senior thesis, one of your guys' uh, capstones, something of that nature. All they did was go and get publicly available 
GIS data for roads in the 48 states, in the, in the continental, the contiguous United States. And they just grabbed all those roads and threw all those roads in a GIS, threw them on a map, and said, okay, what's the area of, of the U.S.? And, and, and for those of you that are in GIS, they, they created a, 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 a bounding function, and, and, and an area around each of those lines, each of those roadways, said, how much of this land is, in, is within X distance of a road? And this is the summary. So on this x-axis, this is distance from the nearest road in meters. Uh, on this axis, this is the proportion of all of the land in the lower 48 states that falls that distance or closer. So for example, if we were curious, we want to know 50%, we could come here, drop down, and we find that about half of the land in the United States of America is within about 500 meters of a road. What's that? Y yes, so, well, so this isn't even all the roads. These are just major roads. This does include some trails and some, some forest roads and stuff, but it's not, it's by no means uh, every little teeny tiny trail. This is just sort of the easy, relatively easy to get data that's out there. Um, so it includes some dirt roads, but, but by no means all of them. So this is Freakazoid, check this out. So this says that within about, within about two kilometers, about 90% of the land, of the area in the lower 48 states is within um, uh, about uh, two-ish kilometers of a road. That's insane, that's crazy, this entire continent, that is, that is amazing. We don't perceive that typically because we're on the car and we're driving to the store and school and stuff and, and it maybe doesn't seem like that big a deal because we don't drive this massive network. The only way you really get a feel is if you, like I was just, you know, just on the airplane coming in, you look out or if you have a tool like Google Earth where you can actually spend a half hour and just screw around and zoom in, zoom out and you actually start to begin to appreciate how ubiquitous this road network is. Here's another way of saying that same thing, in this case looking at watersheds. Same idea, here's, here's the lower 48 states, and this is the proportion of watershed area that is essentially close to a road, or, or, or has, has roads in, in the watershed. And so we go from pool, meaning that of the watershed has, has roads in it, to the hot colors, meaning a lot of, you know, almost the entirety of the, of the um, watershed has roads in it. Yeah. What are the roads defined as? Are they paper? Yeah, great question. So the question is what, what uh, for example, this guy, what were the roads and are they cement, asphalt, dirt, gravel? And this is, this is they just grab stuff. So this is primarily paved roads but it does include some, some unimproved roads, some, some, some gravel and, and dirt trails, fire roads and stuff, but, but, not that, but, but it includes m most of all the main roads, but it doesn't include all the little teeny tiny arteries and stuff, so it, it definitely is biased towards, towards, con towards you know, paved roads. Um, <laughs> it's, yeah, so, th so that, means, that means if we do add in all the different possible roads, this will go even higher, right? This is the, this is the bottom most part. And we do not pull up roads. We only build more roads. So if we did this, you know, a decade later now, if anything, it's going to be um, even higher. Uh, so, so, okay, so what's the pattern you see here? Again, again, blue, not, not that much of the watershed uh, contains a road. Hot means a lot of the watershed contains a road. What, what's the pattern we see? Okay, what about spatially speaking? Where, where are the most fragmented roads, or excuse me, where are the most fragmented watersheds? East Coast, right. This whole, this whole eastern seaboard zone. Anywhere else? Us, yeah, us, right, we're, we're incredibly hot. Uh, same as, you know, Seattle kind of 
Pacific Northwest kind of deal. And then where's the least fragmented zone, zones? Right, the inner mountain zone. So between the Sierras and the Rockies, right, the, the desert area where we have the lowest population. We definitely have roads, but because there are fewer people, it's, it's not like San Francisco or San Diego or something where you just have these mesh networks overlaying everything. It's more like one big road going from this valley to the next kind of thing. So roads are ubiquitous, but there is some amount of spatial segregation to these, uh, to, where, to where the fragmentation is occurring. Oops, sorry. I guess I have a large picture in here, sorry. Is that little patch of blue right there and like that's isolated? Uh, I'm not sure. I'll go back, but this thing will take forever to load back. So, the, so this is not a, a North American phenomenon only. This, we see this all around the world. So here's an example of major um, ar arterial roads in Europe. Europe totally innervated. Europe probably the, the most innervated large region on the planet with roads, um, right? The Romans started doing this and they were experts in building roads and, and many of the roads in Italy and Spain and, and, and many parts of Europe, the roads are still, uh, the roads used are still the things built by the Romans. So one of my, one of my old technicians up at Stanford, um, we talked, what the, what the hell, it was some conversation one day and we talked about, we talked about the old road and I said, oh yeah, let's take the old road. And he goes, you do not have an easy Portuguese. You do not have an old road. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, we have an old road in my village. I'm like, really? So we're like, what's the old road? I was like, our old road was built by the Romans. This was built by the, you know, whatever he said, you know, the, the Spanish or whatever. They're not the old, you know, or something. So, so, so these road networks are real and they have real consequences to critters. So roads have a couple different types of impacts. First and foremost, um, they're affecting the immediate local zone around the, the road itself. And the most, one of the most obvious things, the thing that we're going to start looking at after our midterm, is this is absolute direct killed critters. That can be called direct mortality, can be called roadkill. Um, and it's very easy for us to see roadkill if we have our eyes peeled. Roads also are the, the starting point for the erosion, in many cases, of ecological community integrity. So we can have that, that erosion of these ecological communities if we fragment an area, um, uh, or even if, we don't, if the road isn't actually fragmented, if it's on the left side of the site or whatever, it can degrade, lead to a, a degrading of the ecological function of an area. And then in some cases, if the road is big enough, if let's say we had a small frog pond, the road could just absolutely straight up obliterate it. So we can cut it in half, we can be near it and mess it up, or we can just completely um, remove it. Another major local scale impact of roads would be pollution, facilitating pollution. Now pollution can happen in a couple different ways. The most obvious is air and soil pollution via deposition, via particles coming from our vehicles, either because we're braking with our foot and we have our brake pads which squeeze onto this, this you know, fast spinning object and that causes friction and, and we have little particles of copper and things come off and that material is, you know, falls on the ground kind of thing. That can be from the stuff uh, coming out of the tailpipe, the, the atmospheric uh, material that goes up and then deposits um, in, in the shrubs and stuff, say, alongside the road. So we can have air and, air and, and uh, ground pollution, basically. We can also have water pollution. And that comes from when this deposition, so the oils from our, our, our leaking pipes and such or whatever, uh, uh, um, go onto the roadbed and they sort of stay there and maybe initially they're just on the roadbed when we have the next rain event it pulls that material off and in fact in some places like deserts even if there's no pollution at all even if there's no no oils or anything else the very fact that we have a hard road 
will change how water flows in the desert. So the shrubs will be different sized right next to the road versus 20 feet away. Because essentially the, you're collecting all the water that hit the road and shutting it right to the side. So you're actually watering the plants along the side of the road. So you can change the ecological interactions that way. And then one that, something we don't typically think of but is hugely important is this notion of noise pollution. And we're so used to hearing obnoxious blowhards like me talk when, I, when my voice isn't hoarse. Um, and, and, you know, music and video games and TV and stuff. Um, it's really instructive as one of the activities you'll do when we're doing our roadkill lab is you're going to do some, car, some vehicle counts and just stop by the side of the road a couple times and just, just for a few minutes and count the number of cars. And when you do that, just chill out. Your iPod playing, just sort of, you know, just side of the road, safe place and everything, and just listen. I mean, these roads can be incredibly, incredibly loud things. And for us, that might be annoying. For an animal trying to breed or reproduce or call a mate, whatever it is, um, that can um, drown out their ability to do that, um, that communication. And then just all kinds of altered hydrology and nutrient cycling, all that kind of stuff. So local scale impacts from road fragmentation. Next, we can talk about regional scale. So getting a little bit farther away from the immediate direct vicinity of the, um, of the road. So in this sense, roads frequently facilitate invasive species. Roads are the, the route, the, the, the free pass, the freeway in to bring things we don't necessarily want into more intact systems. There's a huge interplay between uh, urban sprawl and roads. So the notion is, oh my god, we can't drive and traffic is so horrible, let's build some more roads so that we can drive more quickly. And then because we can drive more quickly, it's like, hey, let's put another you know, city out here because now it's only 15 minutes to get to that city. And, and this sort of feedback loop thing goes on. Why do roads facilitate invasive species? I'll show you another picture in a second. Roads facilitate invasive species because right here. So, he, so this is a place up in the San Francisco Peninsula that I used to drive every day. And um, the cars are driving. And I have a better picture in a second, but since, since you asked, a um, uh, very, very heavily trafficked road, lots of vehicles, you know, tens of thousands of vehicles a day, if not more. And eventually, somebody's going to break down, just, you know, laws of probability and nails in the road, whatever it is, flat tire, bad engine, something. You cruise to the side, you cruise to the side, if this is all dried, you know, late summer dried grass and things of that nature, and you pull off the side of the road with a super hot wheel because you had a flat tire, or your tailpipe is super hot, and you touch that grass, there's an excellent chance you're going to start a fire, right? So what our road maintenance uh, folks do is they go, oh my god, let's go and clear all this stuff, right? So we go and we whack down all the vegetation, and um, and, you know, so that there's, there's nothing in the way uh, that might ignite. Or if there is a fire, it's, it's very low vegetation and it'll just smolder. In doing that, we're knocking down long-lived things. We're knocking down trees, we're knocking down shrubs, we're knocking down perennial long-lived plants in many cases. The things that come in are disturbance-loving, disturbance-philic things. And many times, those are weedy things. And many times, weedy things are non-native things. Does that make sense? We, so, we also sometimes come in and, and herbicide the heck out of the place. And we can get in a whole discussion about Roundup resistance that is now spreading. Now spreading amongst, across our roadways, thanks to Monsanto, they, that, that likes to create uh, crops that are resistant to Roundup so that you on your crop or, or you on your lawn can go and spray Roundup and kill everything except for what you want. The problem is that resistance to Roundup gene is, is now getting out. And so, uh, yeah, so that's, that's a whole other conversation. But okay, so facilitates invasive species um, primarily by being this disturbance vector and, and humans just you know, continuing to disturb the roadsides. Uh, major interplay with urban sprawl. Um, is oftentimes the initial step in regional resource extraction. If you're going to go in and do a mine, if you're going to go in and log that forest, almost always the first step is put on a road. 
And those things often have very uh, deleterious effects on, uh, on ecosystems. And then lastly, in, or lastly in this slide at least, roads and trail impacts never are contained. Road and trail impacts are ever expanding. At least roads and trails and natural landscapes. Meaning, we drive. Or, 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 or whatever, a hiking trail. Pick the hiking trail up in Santa Monica. We're hiking, and I say, boo, 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 we're hiking, it's all good, and everybody's walking in single file, and nobody's going out, right? Yeah, that's, that never happens, but assume that happens. All of a sudden, you know, three weeks from now, it rains. Oh my God, it's all muddy. You're gonna walk through the puddle and get your you know, shoes three inches dip deep in water? No, you're gonna step to the side and walk around, which is only natural. But then what, that hap what happens is that trail at the start was this wide, goes to this wide. And because you're walking in there, you're creating little divots, that's going to be muddy. So the next guys that come through in a month or so, they're, oh my God, I want to get my... So, so roads are ever expanding. Intentionally, unintentionally, just the effects are, are constantly um, uh, spilling over, spilling over and widening. So uh, here's an example to show what Stephen was asking about. This is, what's this picture? This picture is up in, uh, on the way to um, Stenson Beach up in Northern California, north of San Francisco. And this is a nice shot. This is springtime, so we see all of our mostly invasive uh, uh, grasses from Europe and Asia, and the hillsides growing. But what you see here, right along the side of this you know, small road, two-lane road, is all this yellow stuff. Very pretty, looks very pretty. This is actually a non-native species. This is Brassica nigra. This is a, a pernicious weed. And it is growing where the road is. On the other side of the fence, where there's cattle to eat it, it's, it's, I mean, it's definitely there, but it's nowhere near this abundance. So in this case, we have all the disturbance that comes through when Caltrans or the Park Service or whoever it is comes and herbicides this, sprays this pesticide to kill all, kill all the plants so that there's less uh, uh, plants that could potentially start fire if someone goes off the road. And so all the, the native guys that might occupy that space and the longer live guys that might occupy that space are disturbed and knocked down and knocked down. So who comes in is the disturbance-loving or disturbance-philic um, uh, critters. And in this case, if the cows had access to the full road, they would keep them down too, but, but they don't, right? So um, in some cases, like Robert was saying, also in some cases along the roadside, we intentionally plant weedy non-native. And so this is a term that we'll talk about later, but, but um, NIS, which is not, it stands for non-native invasive species. This has to do with the terminology, which we'll talk about later, but, but um, you can just write non-native invasive species. So sometimes we intentionally stick in these things, like ice plant, like this, this beach dune grass from Europe and, and other things, because when we put this road in, maybe the soil was denuded and we wanted something to hold the soil and people are like, oh, I want something that grows instantly like tomorrow, let's plant this stuff. And so we've, we've directly facilitated these, the introduction of some of these things. And then, independent of those things, this is, it's just easier for things to move up and down here. So it's, it's an easy dispersal corridor. Yeah, and I already said dispense, uh, selecting for dis disturbance felix uh, species. And roads are a factor in, in, the, in the North America in something like about 50% of the endangered species roads factor into why they are becoming rare. Either they're killed with roadkill or their predators are coming in through the road or something of that nature. And we already talked about this. There's this, there's this positive feedback loop with urban sprawl where we start with congestion and then it goes, oh my God, we need more roads to alleviate the congestion. Let's build more roads. And then because we can build more roads, you can drive more quickly, that tends to foster more cities. And then because we, those cities get built, um, occupied, all of a sudden there's more cars and it's congestion. It's this positive feedback loop. So this slide just represents that. Don't worry about uh, copying all this stuff down. This is just sprawl is facilitated with roads. I mentioned also that roads are often the first step in resource extraction. This picture is in the Amazon. And you can see uh, there was intact forest, at least on the left. And on the right, it's starting to be cut down and, 
and, uh, and, and burnt and all that, that horrible stuff. And, and the, the mechanism for that is this dirt pipeline of a road. Most of the time these roads go in as a straight line or pretty straight line to the mine or the dam or, or whatever it is or a pinch point if, it's, if we're talking hydrological stuff. Um, increasingly roads in the developing world especially are put in to, um, to, to serve multiple functions. So first and foremost it's often for economic development. So very poor folks, we want to you know, start mining an area so we get some money so we can build some schools, that kind of stuff. But they're also a factor in a whole variety of things like projecting military power. The, the reason we have our highway system is because people wanted to kill the Russians, right? So in the Cold War, we, wanted to ha we made these new things, these intercontinental ballistic missiles. And uh, people wanted to be able to move those missiles on, on semis and stuff all around the U.S. and or move troops around as the, you know, as the Reds came in and invaded the country. So the initial impetus for funding the, internet, the interstate highway system was national security. There's all these extra benefits to helping the economy and stuff, but the, real, the initial thing was to be able to project military power around the U.S. better. Uh, people often talk about poverty alleviation. That's what they're doing in Turkey right now. Um, and uh, yeah, so stuff like that. So there we go. So let's talk now specifically about roadkill. So all those things are going on, but let's just pick roadkill because that's an easy one to wrap our heads around and, and see some of the examples. Is that, any questions about that stuff so far? Make sense, everybody? Sure, sure, yeah, right. I mean, so, so it is, it, a fire can be a bad thing, absolutely. I'm not saying that you shouldn't clear, um, that you shouldn't uh, chop down the weeds on the side of the road. But just real, but that, this is an example of this road effect or ever expanding. So you don't, you never just put in a road. You put in a road and then have to do the maintenance. And then because there's something coming off the hill, you have to do something with the culvert. And then, and they just, the effect is always expanding, 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 expanding. Roadkill, this is, this, is, this is tough to really measure because we, we, and we will do this in our class, we'll, we'll measure roadkill rates. It's hard to figure out some of the other rates. The, the death rate of rabbits due to hawks, the death rate of rabbits due to coyotes and things. But roadkill, at least we can see, and the suspicion is for at least several different species that the, that the source of mortality that is cars is greater than almost all, if not other aspects um, in the life of these mobile animals. So the most likely way they will die is via a car. This is especially true for large, slow-moving things that are the kind of things that we are most, most likely to note or see an article in the Ventura County Star or something like that. So bear, deer, mountain lion, coyote, um, but even the smaller things like rabbits, like this rabbit here on the top of Portrero Grade, and, and snakes. So, yeah, I know, it's pretty crazy. So, well, there's a couple crazy things about this. One, the bear is going out. Two, those people appear to be swerving towards the bear. Um, so, so, you know, <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll just say that, yeah. So there you go, good times. Animals, when they want to move and we've fragmented their habitat, in many cases they will find a way around it. So here's a case where we have put in a road and we've put some type of barrier to try to exclude the animal from crossing. In this case a fox. Fox doesn't, doesn't care. He's going to go and look around the whole way till he finds the little uh, gap that maybe to you and I doesn't appear to be that big but get under and, and then he might be screwed. Uh, here's another one where the fence actually did, uh, was, was, you know, contiguous with the ground, but, 
but some animals, that wasn't enough for them, so they actually dig, they excavated their own, their own way to get across. They were so interested in going from one side of the road to the other, which suggests that something, mates, food, water, you know, whatever the case may be, um, they needed to go across there. If, this, if they had all of their requirements on, on the side over here, they wouldn't be spending all this time scratching, digging through rocks to, to try to go under um, and through a death maze, basically, right? So uh, this is a wolf in uh, Croatia that was, that was killed. We'll talk about these in a second. Um, uh, we note when, these, when, when, when this happens, right? We note when it's something uh, big that... Now, a rabbit is, is sad and is bad, but you probably don't care too much about a rabbit. And, and most people probably don't care too much about a rabbit. This thing, if you hit this thing, it doesn't matter if you like warm fuzzies or not. If you hit this thing, there's an excellent chance that your car is screwed up. And you might get an accident. You might actually die, right? So, so there, this notion of wildlife, human, wildlife vehicle encounters is not a totally esoteric thing, even for folks that don't perhaps value natural populations as much. It, it's a true risk to themselves as well as to the critters. Um, this is not only an issue with, with roads, this is also an issue with any kind of linear transportation system and the most obvious other one is, is um, rail, railways and so this is a bear. Um, this is in Croatia as well. Or, uh, yeah, I think this one's in Croatia. So we're going to do, uh, ne you know, next week after our midterm, but we're going to, you know, essentially take a look at our county. Our county is pretty cool for many reasons. One, because we're here. Everybody, everybody say, yeah. yeah. There you go, see? You guys are good. Um, but we're really interesting, and for a study on roadkill, we're particularly well suited. We have coast, we have inland. We have about a third of our county is wilderness, about a third of our county is ag, about a third of our county is urban, suburban. Um, we have wetlands, we have rivers, we have coastal mountains, inland mountains, so we have, it's kind of a neat place. Very few uh, communities, we have snow while, you, you know, we, we can be in the snow and then half an hour later be out, out surfing, right? So, so we have this really interesting cross-section of different communities and, and things, so it's a, it's a nice place. So the question is, so one of the things that we're going to be spending some time uh, looking at <clears throat> is trying to figure out what's, how many animals die in, in our part of the world. And as a focal region, we'll, we'll have two focal regions. One is the Santa Monica National Recreation Area. And so it would be interesting to know how many animals die, plus or minus some error, you know, each year. Is it is it 50 animals? Is it 500? Is it 5,000? Is it 50,000? You know, what's, what's the deal? Secondly, um, we're going we're gonna to be interested in asking what's the kill rate of animals on roads across the entirety of the county? Same thing. You know, what, what's the average number of things whacked plus or minus some, some, some error? If we take Again, only the major roads. This is not all the roads. This is not a little teeny uh, 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 forest trails and stuff. This is just the major roads, county roads, state roads. And throw them up on a map. So here's the pink, here's the Santa Monica Mountains that we're going to look at. But, but for this figure, I just put up Ventura County. And the roads are a little line here. The yellow is the area within 100 meters of a road. The a darker burnt orange color is the area within 500 meters of a road. And what, what pattern do you see? Right. So the only place where there's some decent, not massively, completely, totally fragmented area is up in our wil Sespe Wilderness and, you know, that part of the county. You know, Oxnard, Thousand Oaks, you know, wherever you want to pick, everywhere else, it's Almost, every, almost the entirety of the landscape is within 500 meters of a road. So if you're a critter, if you're a rabbit, if you're a snake, if you're a whatever the heck, that's a real threat to you. That's why roadkill is either the greatest source of mortality or one of the very high ones. And again, it's something we don't appreciate. This is one measure of how fragmented our ecosystems are.
and this, this is what started me thinking about this and working on this and doing a lab for you guys, which was a female coyote I saw um, a couple years ago up on Potrero Road here. And for various reasons, I was leaving sort of late in the day for a couple weeks. And I, used to, I saw her like, I don't know, four or five times cross the road from, from uh, you know, going up, up uh, Potrero here, up the right, cross over onto the, to the um, land just to the left of the road. And she was a pregnant female. And then one day I drove and she was dead on the side of the road. And her, her pups were um, obviously dead too. And it was very sad. And it got me thinking like, wow, how often does this happen? And when I asked folks, nobody knew. And so that's why we, we started in with this, with this project. Um, as we've already heard, the, f the roads act as a constricting factor to dispersal and movement, etc. So as we now know, uh, unfortunately this slide is a couple years old, but um, it serves to make the point. As we now know, the la our last adult, our last tagged mountain lion was killed approximately uh, seven weeks ago by someone maliciously, intentionally, that just wanted to kill it and took the collar and, and all that kind of stuff. And it was killed over here. Um, and as you know, uh, right about that same time, um, a juvenile, one of its offspring, was killed over here um, uh, on the four, Sepulveda Pass on the 405. Um, uh, that was roadkill. And what you see here, these are the radio track. Uh, so, so this is the collar, animals moving around, and this is over the course of a long period of time, their range. So this is where the animal is routinely you know, going to, walking around, looking for food, mates, whatever. And what we see is basically for this guy, for this male, this dark, this dark uh, uh, sort of oval, horizontal oval shape, Essentially, the territory is the entirety of the Santa Monica Mountains. So, as we know, these, these guys are asocial and they don't really do well with overlapping territories. So this says that, we, that the entirety of the Santa Monica Mountains can be, is habitat for maybe one or maybe a few mountain lions. And what's bounding it? The Oxnard Plain here with all of our roads. PCH and, and the Pacific Ocean, right? Okay, so right there. Um, Santa Monica and all those roads. And this thing right here is the 101. So the 101 is a real barrier to movement. And long term, if we don't do something about that, there will not be mountain lions in the Santa Monica Mountains, except for some actor, you know, Hollywood retreat studio or something like that, right? <laughs> so a real challenge, real challenge to figure out what to do with this. Okay, so here's our first example. Let's look more in depth at roadkill. In this case, we're going to jump over to Florida and we're going to talk about the Florida black bear. The Florida black bear lives in a forested area, prefers closed understory vegetation, so you know, the dark, the dark forest thing, not, not so much an open meadow type critter. These bears are omnivorous, so they'll eat, you know, dead, th dead animals, they'll eat, they'll eat plant material, whatever. The, bulk of this bear's diet are mostly nuts and roots and berries. Um, they also, they particularly like palmetto hearts, which are these little sort of palm-shaped looking things that are small that we don't really have around here, but they're common in the southeast. Um, the, they're sexually dimorphic, so the, the male, the adult male, is something on the order of 220 kilos. Female is roughly um, about half that size. And it's Florida's largest remaining um, terrestrial mammal. They have uh, manatees and things, but, but on land, the largest remaining mammal. They're asocial, just like those, just like those mountain lions we've talked about. Uh, the males have territories on the order of about 175 square kilometers and Again, similar to the mountain lions, the females have a, a smaller habitat. In this case, the females have a, have a quite significantly smaller habit, uh, 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 excuse me, home, home territory, I should say. Um, the, they may, moms give birth to somewhere between one to three cubs uh, around the, the turn of, the, around the new year. And mom takes care of that cub or cubs for about a year and a half, at which point she goes into estrus again and kicks, kicks the, the juvenile's out and, and she uh, mates again. 
a black bear in Florida we think historically had something on the order of a one to two decade lifespan. So that's a pretty, that's a pretty long lived uh, critter. They were declared federally threatened. We haven't gone in depth into endangered species yet, but, but real quickly suffice it to say we have, uh, uh, you know, not worried, candidate for listing, threatened, endangered, and then extinct. So these guys first went on to this warning level, the level that we call threatened in 1974. We think that historically, meaning on the order of about 500 odd years or so ago, in the state of Florida, we had something like 12,000 bears, uh, you know, kind of pre-disturbance, basically. And the last estimate that I know of from 2007 estimated that we had somewhere between 1,000 to 1,500 bears, so but a, but a fraction, you know, 10%-ish of their historic abundance. This is some data for bears killed by, car, killed by cars. You can see this on the right. If, if it's a little low and you can't quite see it, this is, this is um, uh, uh, time back in the day till now. They're, they're listed as threatened in 1974, so right around then they started monitoring this, and so the first data we have is 76. And, it, and this data goes up to 2004, but the pattern remains. And over this 28 year period, uh, all, about 1,350-ish bears were killed. So over this 30-year period, and again, the lifespan is, is about 20 years-ish, we, as many bears as we think are alive right now, died by cars alone. So cars are a major source of mortality for this, this critter. Also note that the kill rate by cars is going up. It's not staying stable, it's not going down. And that's because more people are moving to Florida, more roads, more vehicle trips, all that, uh, more shopping malls, all that kind of stuff. And so, this is a typical road, oh, shoot. I went, I took my son and dad to go see the last space shuttle launch this summer, and I, I, I went here, and I actually have better new pictures. I just realized I forgot to put them in, I apologize. But, but you guys get the idea here. Um, this is, you know, this is closed forest on either side. There's no barrier. There's no, there's no wall, there's no, there's no fence. And so you can see how it's relatively easy for the bear to oopie doopie 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 doo walk from the, the, their desirous place to all of a sudden in the middle of a killing zone. And um, for, for this poor guy, uh, it, uh, that's what happened. So here's the distribution of uh, the remnant black bears in Florida. Pink is their remnant, you know, primary best habitat, best place where they can hang out. The, the blue represents areas where they can hang out, but it's not ideal, but maybe. And so they're in various spots, uh, but this area right here um, in the northern part of the state has more than half of the roadkill deaths. So this is, even though they're everywhere, there's this huge hot spot here. So if we're talking about roadkill as we are today, this is where you gotta start, or this is where you wanna start. Figure out what's going on. So, these are kills over um, about a two year period in the early 90s, early mid 90s. And this is the Atlantic Ocean on the far right, right here. This is Daytona Beach where, you know, spring break, blah, 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 you know, go wild, all that silly stuff you people do. Um, and, uh, you know, so big, big urban center, big, you know, hoity toity, uh, you know, uh, Daytona uh, 500 and, and all that kind of jazz. And then, as we look off to the left, as we're looking more into the interior part of the terrestrial environment, the, the uh, light gray color here represents forested area that's potential bear habitat. The lines uh, obviously represent roads. The uh, uh, coloration, it's a little, I ripped this from a PDF and it wasn't the highest quality PDF, so I apologize especially if you're in the back, it might be a little bit hard to see, but the, the red triangles represent a bear kill. So a bear was whacked here in this approximately two year, two year period. The pink dots represent what's called a bear nuisance report, meaning someone saw a bear on the side of the road and it, maybe it was wounded or maybe they just saw it and they called the cops or animal control or whatever, but they never found a, a body. So therefore, 
stare at this, and you guys tell me what the pattern is to bear kills in this part of Florida. So we'll take a minute and just stare at this for a second. <clears throat> So they're around roads, okay, okay. But what else? Uh, okay, okay. Okay, so Alex is saying that, that um, the area, like if we look over to the left, say, left part of the map here, um, where we have more of the lightish gray color, that there appears to be more, more kills in that area, okay. Maybe, what else? Say again. Okay, so the larger roads. So, so, so roughly the, 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 the number of lanes, the size of the road, is related to the thickness of the line here. So we have the observation that where there's thick line, thick line roads, there's more kills. Is that right? So they're definitely associated with the roads, absolutely. But is it always with the thicker lines? Okay. Yeah. So these these are these are these are like two lane like that picture I showed. These are these are one or two lane kind of backcountry roads. These uh, uh, thicker ones are more like you know the one on one. You know, like four or five lanes each way kind of thing. So which kind of roads have more kill? Why? They're in, the, they're in the bear habitat, but uh, here's bear habitat. Here's bear habitat as well. It's not as obvious that you're going to kill one small road. I mean, if you have that big, huge, wide, you know, obvious, is this a where I belong type of thing, it's a very clear picture question. So looking at the freeway when the cars are constantly going by, it's more right. obvious of a threat than, right. Excuse me. Right. Good. Robert? Could it be because those roads aren't as heavily populated, so there's it, more bears there? I mean, obviously, the bigger freeways, there's more traffic, so they're avoiding those more. Right. So you guys are saying, uh, Robert and Cassidy are saying basically the same thing. And the freeways have, like, walls around them. Right. And, like, right. The roads don't. Like, right. Little two-lane highways don't have, like, fences or roads. Exactly. So you guys are all basically hitting on the same thing. Uh huh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Th this appears to be a fairly realistic barrier to bear dispersal, right? There's there's one, two, three, four, maybe that that maybe are are not, uh, you know, that that are to the to the east of that that major artery. So that's true. That's good. Yeah. And 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 so the thing you guys are picking up on is, um, if you have the 101. What's the 101, right? The 101 is, even if you're on it at 2 in the morning, zing, you know, with the, the, with the low. So one time, when I was, when I was uh, just a new graduate student, the um, Northridge earthquake happened. And there's a whole crazy story I can tell you if you want me to tell you a story. But basically, I thought that I left this totally nasty, evil gas on my desk. And it was in an office, and it wasn't labeled. It was, you know, it was like an office. It wasn't labeled. And I heard that they're going door to door at UCLA checking to see if there's wounded people. And I was freaked out there was going to be this like, you know, 50-year-old secretary lady like going, hello, is anybody there? Open the door and like die from this, this gas. So I jumped in my car because I couldn't get through to UCLA because you know, all the lines were screwed up. And I drove to campus to make sure that no one was going to open that door and, and die. And long story short, I, I was living in, a, in Manhattan Beach. And so I, I got on the freeway and drove from Manhattan Beach, which is south of LAX, all the way up to West, Westwood uh, and passed two cars. So it was like the end of the world. It was like Omega Man. It was like very, very disturbing. And never see that again. Um, that was pretty much you know, one of the only times when that road segment, you know, in the last who knows how many decades, didn't have a gazillion million cars going on it. So even at two in the morning, it's zoom, zoom, zoom. Zoom. And then most times of the day, it's like, so you're right. A bear or a whatever 
It's going to walk up and kind of go, uh, what? You know, it's essentially a wall of moving, of, of moving metal, right? I mean, it's, it's, you'd have to be being chased by a predator or something to even think about bolting out in there in most cases. So in effect, these thick roads have, relatively speaking, relatively speaking, fewer kills because they're so intimidating, sound-wise, visually, you know, however you want to slice it. It's these smaller roads where it is more like zoom, and then nothing for a while, and the bird's like, what? You know, like looking right, <laughs> looking left, and they're like, oh, hey, I guess I'll go across here, and then like some, you know, some Don Johnson his Lamborghini comes by, or whatever the heck, and, and whacks you. So, uh, over, over this, this one uh, section of, of road, um, uh, again, the same period, these are, the, these are the kind of things that these, that during this intensive survey they found in terms of roadkill. Organisms that they encountered, yeah? Correct, <laughs> correct. And we, will, and we will have a lot of question marks, because things get smushed. Oh no, don't know what species of snake oh, okay. it is. They could tell it was a snake, but it's just too smushed to tell. Uh, yeah, so that's unknown snake, unknown bird, and that's unknown, unknown kind of thing. So yeah, so turkey vulture, a gray fox, a water moccasin, which is a kind of snake, a hawk, a cardinal, a starling, another kind of bird, a snake, owls, alligator, um, you know, different birds, um, turkeys, uh, the cooter is, it's like a, it's like a duck kind of thing, uh, egrets, uh, snakes, Deer, bear, uh, turtles, uh, tortoises, armadillos, rabbits, possums, all this stuff, right? From, from this one small section of surveying. And so you can imagine, if you extrapolate this out, how many critters are killed and the diversity of things that are killed. Uh, in our surveys, we've been doing our surveys now, f I don't even know, we've been doing our surveys for about about five years, five and a half years, I think we have 78 categories of things that we've seen killed. So, um, yeah, so th there's potentially a lot of stuff dead on these roads. So this is, this, is, this is how this can be helpful for planning. So this isn't an activity, right? Conservation biology is not an activity where we go up and say, yeah, you dummy, just stop doing it, right? It's really about providing tools to help people minimize the impact. And this is how we can turn that data into something useful. So for example, on this particular case, this study was done because these folks wanted to expand this particular roadway, uh, State Route 46. And so by doing this roadkill survey, by quantitatively measuring the mortality on this stretch of road, they were able to determine and measuring the traffic volume on this section of road, different times of the year and stuff, they were able to correlate the number of, of dead bears, for example, with the, um, with the flow rate. And so what we have on the bottom here, this is daily traffic volumes. This is ranges from 2,000 cars per day to 16,000 cars per day. And then on this axis, this is the number of bears killed. And so it's a very simple regression. You could do this much more elegantly, but you know, for quick and dirty, this is they do a simple regression and show that as traffic volume increases, uh, more, more bears are going to get whacked. So what you can do is you can take the slope of that line and you can use it as a first gross approximator. And what that line tells us is, so they were starting with you know, X, 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 a road of X size and we want to say add two more lanes, say we want to double the capacity or whatever the case may be. This simple relationship tells us in this case from this data from 76 to 99 that if we expand the road we'll get one additional bear death per year for every additional 2,500 more cars per day on the road. So that's cool. Now we can have an adult conversation about this. Now we can say, is it really important to expand, you know, make this road larger? Maybe it is. But we were going into it wide-eyed saying, if we do that, we're going to expect, you know, if we made it, if we made 5,000 more vehicle trips per year, we'd expect, on average, two additional bears to get whacked each year. And so we say, okay, well, that's not good. So yes, we'll let you do that, do that expansion if you help us make, you know, 
pass for the bears and, you know, or, or, or make a baby, you know, a bear rearing facility, you know, whatever it is. So we can use this data, which is not complex, but is very key. And without this data, we're shooting, you know, shooting in the wind. It's like, well, I don't know if we make it big. Is that, is that good? Is that bad? So here's an example of how roadkill uh, data can truly help us with um, planning and stuff. The first thing you can do, the simplest thing you can do with road with roadkill is to put up signs, say, hey, there's a lot of animals here, don't drive too fast. But people tend to not read the signs. So this is a, a sign from Australia. And it says, watch out for unfenced road. There's like kangaroos and, and emus and, and camels. And this uh, emu here did not read the sign. So so yeah, so signs are the first thing to do, no problem, relatively cheap, relatively easy, you can definitely try it, maybe it'll work, but, but usually we have to go beyond simple signage. And the invention here, which was, was really first uh, thought about and really started to be used in Europe, is this notion of wildlife crossings. And wildlife crossing is a tool, is a structure that's intended to connect once contiguous Habitat, it could be forest, could be meadow, <clears throat> could be wetlands, whatever, that are fragmented by something, a linear structure, a trail, a road, a, a railroad, whatever it is. And um, so in this sense, they're one type of wildlife corridor, and a corridor is a, is a place where things move, can move through the matrix, right? Using Associating wildlife crossings with road, as I said, is, is a European idea. Now people are using it all around the world. Wildlife crossings um, include a variety of structures. Some take animals over the road. Some take animals under the road. So wildlife crossing is one subtype of wildlife corridor. This is a fake picture. This is not real. But this is sort of an idealized version. This is photoshopped up. But here we can see, here's our road, and this would be maybe sort of more of an ideal type, type situation. Where we need to put a road in for whatever reason, a railroad, a, 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 you know, autobahn, something. And it would be cool if we had areas that were essentially old, intact, healthy, uh, you know, landscapes. And it would be great if there were multiple places where the critters could go across as opposed to a single pinch point. If you, you know, a single pinch point is better than no pinch point, but the ideal set setting would be lots of places for critters to safely uh, move across this dangerous structure. Then the cars could get to do what they want to do, the animals could get to do what they want to do. In the case of the Florida example, going back to Florida now, uh, uh, we can we can use existing structures sometime. In this case, this is Florida. This is a this is a a wet place, and so people know that, and so they don't want the road to be flooded. So we have some of these underpasses that are originally put in for water to flow under in the wet season. So if you put a camera out there, I was just out uh, last couple days out in our site in Louisiana putting out camera traps. Um, in our uh, wetland restoration there. And these things can be activated in different ways. They can be activated with a pressure plate, which is essentially a fancy trigger for the camera. When the animal of a certain weight steps on it, it takes a picture. Or they can be infrared triggered. And so in this case, we see an alligator going underneath the road so he's not getting whacked um, as if he were to cross over the road bed. Here's a different view of that of that place in a different season. And what we can see what they've done here is, is so the, they've, the road is, is you know, elevated, water can go underneath, and by the way, animals can too. And so here's one thing that's very common you'll see. One, we have this actual crossing structure. Two, we have something that helps guide the organisms to that crossing structure. In this case, this is a fence. So this is expensive, and we might only have one of these crossing structures every so often and you know you have to be pretty lucky for the animal to just kind of boom and, and magically hit this spot so what you do is you put a fence out that way and a fence out that way and 
now if the animal hits me, I'm golden, hits my shoulder, he'll, he'll get directed towards you know, my chest. If it's my hand, it'll go towards my forehead, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's a way of, um, of, of directing animals to the safe place to cross. <clears throat> okay, we're almost at a breaking point here. So I haven't updated this in a while, but it's because we don't really have great data. So people don't really study this, so it hasn't really changed that much. But these estimates um, aren't meant to be perfect, but they're meant to rather give you a sense of the magnitude of roadkill. In 2004, we had uh, 253,000 automobile accidents where the car struck an animal. And just FYI, if you ever did do hit a deer or something like that, do not clean your, do not wash your car off. The tendency is people like, wham, and it dents their headlight up or whatever the heck, and they come on like, oh man, they rinse it all off. Wait, call the insurance guy and have him come over because they want to see if there's fur on your thing. Otherwise, they're like, oh, this, this idiot ran into a post or something like that, right? So anyway, that's a, that's a side note. Um, one estimate that it's not really necessarily backed up by data, but it's more like what a lot of people sort of say, but at least it's, it's out there. Um, on the or, something on the order of about a million vertebrates killed in the lower 48 states on roads every, every day. That's huge, every day, right? Now, that, that doesn't, that's not all bears. That, that's, that's you know, snakes and rabbits and stuff, but still, it's, it's a huge, it's a huge amount. Uh, in Yellowstone in 2004 alone, six bears were killed by cars. Uh, as of 2004, this thing over here on the right, this is the West Coast version of Roadkill Bingo, they'd sold 25,000 games. And so what this is, this is bingo, just like, you know, A, B, 42, right? In this case, it's for when you're driving with the family to, to Yosemite or whatever the heck, and you're trying to keep the kids occupied back. You can do, you know, state license plates, or you can say, who saw a tire? Who saw a dead squirrel? Who saw a dead deer? Right? And it once say this kind of a novelty thing, like a quirky, er, 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 kind of Christmas gift. But if it was just an uh, you know, silly game. If it was just a sort of silly joke gift, you'd probably sell several thousand or something like that. You wouldn't be selling 25,000, right? So this must be at least vaguely telling us that it's, some people can use this as a game, right? Which is some indicator of the level of dead things around. Um, in New Mexico, on New Mex in the state of New Mexico, um, in 2001, we had 2,349 large vertebrates, meaning big deer. Uh, uh, you know, um, wolves, you know, like that large kind of animals. In Saguaro National Park, which is in Texas, um, they've estimated they have 51,000 vertebrates killed each year. And these are mostly the larger, larger bodied guys. And then closer to home here in the Mojave where we have our de desert tortoise, which isn't somebody doing desert tortoise this semester? No? Okay, good. Um, so, so desert tortoise uh, used to be abundant, now you know, is heading towards, towards extinction, and they move very slowly. If you pick them up, they like, oh my god, they like urinate, and they usually die, because they blast out all their water, and they, they essentially die of dehydration. So, th so they're, 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 they don't move quickly. Um, desert, so in this one section, where we had a lot of dead, tortoises and their population numbers were going down, we, we put a fence around one 15-mile section of this highway, and just that fence alone reduced the, the, reduced the um, road kill by 93%, which says that you know, most, of the, most of what was taken this local part of this population out, at least, was this road. I think we will... Yeah, we'll put it on pause there. So we'll pick this up on Wednesday. <laughs>